Thank you for coming this evening. We're here as part of a series of panels on socialist solutions to pressing problems. And we've talked about low wages, segregation, education, health care. Tonight we're talking about housing. And we have with us some of the best housing activists in New York City. And my name is Howie Hawkins. I'm the Green Party candidate for governor. And immediately to my right is Alicia Boyd, who is with the Movement to Protect the People in Brooklyn. And then to her right is Zin Shun Ning, who's with the City Right Alliance Against Displacement. And on the far right is Thomas Honan, who's a member of the Socialist Party USA and a tenant lawyer. So what I think we're going to go from left to right, except I'll wrap it up, but I'll just do a little introduction by saying I'm from Syracuse, and our housing problems are a little different. When the Great Crash hit in uh, 2008, we were ranked 100th in property values. So everybody crashed and bounced. We're like, what? You can get a four-bedroom house for $35,000, $40,000 in Syracuse. We're so poor. Highest concentrated black and Latino poverty, fifth highest white concentrated poverty of any city in the nation. Uh, so it's different, but at the same time, because of and I'll talk about this more, but basically the racist real estate industry concentrates poor, makes many people of color in neighborhoods where they can jack up the rent and they scare the white people that can get out of town to buy houses in the suburbs and make money from both ends. And that game's been going on for decades and that's why, particularly in New York State, we're the most segregated state in the country. And the rent is too damn high. And now, what strikes me, when I look at, I call it now the state media for two-party system, in this country, you have the left, the progressives, Bill de Blasio, the Working Families Party, and so forth, on every week. And de Blasio is driving the working class out of Manhattan and much of Brooklyn and much of New York City. And if that's the left, I mean, God help us. <laughs> so I'm, there's going to be a debate tomorrow night without, it's the two government parties sponsored by the state media, this time CBS, which happened to have given $87,000 to Governor Ken Cuomo's campaign uh, coffers. And there's a FCC, Federal Communications Provision, that says equal time for uh, all candidates on uh, publicly licensed TV stations. So we will be seeing them in court, and I'll be seeing them live streaming tomorrow night, answering the nonsense we're going to get from the Democrat and Republican. Uh, but what we're here today to talk about is what can we do about the housing crisis here in the city. And to start us off, Alicia Boyd is going to talk about her experiences working with Moving for the People in Brooklyn. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd, and I represent MTOP, the Movement to Prepare People, Flat Flatbush Housing Against Corruption. Can you speak louder, please? Yeah. Cool. I have a teacher's voice. Um, my name is Alicia, and I represent the movement to protect the people and flat flower lovers against corruption. Um, I'm located in the Flatbush Crown Heights community um, that drives off of Cosplay Park and the Book and Botanic Gardens. And as you already may know, there has been a massive amount of gentrification and displacement that's happening all throughout the city. However, uh, what a lot of people don't understand is how that crisis came to be. That crisis came to be is because during the um, Bloomberg administration, there was 140 rezonings that were done throughout the entire New York City, all quietly done. What they did is they went into communities, white middle class communities, and what they did is they did down zoning, and they did height limits. The moment that you go into a community and you down zone, that means you limit the potential of development in that community. And you automatically increase the values of those communities, and thus you create scarcity. So what happened is by going into all of these, the white middle class communities and creating scarcity, 
they sat there and created the housing crisis. But the housing crisis wasn't for communities of color, they were actually for white people, people with moderate incomes, um, students that were coming back from home. They no longer could afford to live in the community they were raised in because the property values have went up because these communities now were scarce. So that left all the communities who were not rezoned underneath the Bloomberg administration. And that means all the communities of color were not rezoned. So then as these groups of people decided that they needed to find housing, instead of going into their communities because there was no housing available, they started to go into communities of color, the ones that were right next door to them. And then this began the wave of displacement of communities of color because once white people started coming into communities of color, that became the signal for gentrification. Landlords started raising the rents in affordable communities and pushing out the long-term residents. But now these long-term residents had no other communities to go to because now all of the communities of color were now becoming very expensive and now you have 100,000 people in the homeless shelter. When Bloomberg created this program in the early 19, in 2004, there were 20,000 people in the homeless shelter. Today there's 100,000. That's how well his plan has worked. And it was all underneath the creation of quote unquote affordable. So that became the crisis. And then what happened is then they started looking at, once the crisis became evident, communities of color, people did not have any place to go. Then they said, oh, we need to create housing opportunities. We have a scarcity of housing. So of course, where are we going to put the housing? We're going to put the increased housing in the community that did not have any protection. So they decided that there were going to be 15 neighborhoods in all communities of color in New York City that were being identified to have increased development in these communities so that it could address the housing shortage. However, that plan was really about creating wealth because you were then taking communities of color that had very low property values and then you were now allowing those property values to be increased because you are allowing the potential of those developments to now have taller buildings. So for example, if you had a piece of property and it was worth $10 a square foot, once you rezone it and allow them to build 30 stories on a, a three-story lot, now you can build 30 stories, but the value of that land just increased just like that to $400 a square foot, just like that with a sign of a pen. So that became instant wealth. So they would go into communities, buy up the land, get involved in the rezoning, change the rezoning, allow these large buildings to go up, and then of course the developments then became luxury developments. And pushing luxury developments all throughout the communities. In my community, we were very fortunate, not on the wood, we were very fortunate because we were able to stop the rezoning. And we're the only community of color that has ever been able to stop the rezoning. Because once the rezoning process starts, it ends with rezoning of our communities. And we were able to stop it at the community board level before it got into the hands of the Department of City Planning. Because once the Department of City Planning gets a hold of a rezoning plan, legally there's nothing that you can do. They have absolute rights. And we all know in New York City that the Department of City Planning is simply the arm of the real estate developers. All their job is to do is to find opportunities for real estate developers to go into communities and be able to make money. So my community was one of the most valuable communities because we had one thing that all the other communities didn't have. We had views. We had park views and we had garden views. And so the, that's what made my community one of the most valuable communities, unlike other communities. So they wanted my community. However, they knew that it was a very well organized community. They know that we go out and vote. But unfortunately, we are a loyalist community. And so we are loyal to the Democratic Party. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And, and that's one of our downsides. Instead of looking at, we continue to perpetuate the idea that the Democratic Party is supporting us, that it is a, a party for the people, for people of color, when in fact it is not a party for the people, it is a party for the real estate industry. And it's just, you know, that's exactly what it is. And, you know, here we have it, it these zonings are created and done by the Democratic Party. The city council is, is a democratic council. They're the ones who do the voting. They're the ones who pass the vote, the zoning laws. They're the ones who pass the zonings. And it's all underneath the Democratic Party. And yet we continue to be told that the Democratic Party is really working in our favor when it is not. After they were, for four years, they've been trying to get a rezoning done as a community. And they've been very unsuccessful because of the work that myself and my organization have been able to do. However, it has not been easy. We have been arrested. We have faced jail time. My comrade in arms in handcuffs over there. Um, we have filed lawsuits to challenge the violations of the law. Um, we've been ridiculed in the media. Um, we've been called every possible name that you could think of. Um, and it's been a struggle to keep my community from in a rezoning process. So now what they're doing is instead of them trying to get a district-wide rezoning, because it seems to be almost impossible to do that, they're trying to go out individually on their own. So right now we are facing a rezoning where there are developments being proposed along the Book of Botanic Gardens in what is known as a six to seven story height limited zone. That means is that in 1991, there was some major development happening in the Book of Botanic Gardens. They realized that along the perimeter of the garden there was potential for major development. So the city in 1991 <coughs> was more concerned about gardens than development. And so they put the height limits in. They said, no, you can't build anything past six or seven stories. We know that anything past 13 stories would be detrimental to the garden. We're putting these height limits. Well, guess what? 2018, they are trying to lift those height limits and say, oh, there's really no thing wrong with 22 stories and a six or seven story height limit. Don't you worry. There's nothing going to happen to the garden. So instead of it going underneath a district-wide plan, they are now doing it individual, and so we're fighting them individually. So right now we are preparing for a lawsuit to file against the developers and the city because the city has refused to make the developers do an environmental impact analysis. That means the city is saying to the developers, it's okay, go ahead and build, don't worry about the garden. And we're saying, no, you're supposed to worry about the garden. If you stated in your records that 13 plus stories would be detrimental to the garden, and you're trying to build a 22 story building, why isn't there an environmental impact analysis so we can see what type of negative effects can happen? Well, the city is saying they don't need to have that. So we are now fighting that particular struggle on an individual basis. And just to plug in one more thing, we have a fundraiser that we are doing. Our annual fundraiser is happening on November the 1st. So if you would like to really support us, if you can come, I have tickets in my back pocket. <laughs> so if you would like to come and support us, that would be really great and buy a ticket from us. We are a low moderate income community. We have been doing these lawsuits all pro se. We have not had the resources like some of our neighboring communities to hire lawyers. So it's really a labor of love and, you know, you know what we can get uh, from people. So if anybody's interested in supporting us and buying a ticket tonight, that would be really helpful. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tishan. Uh, I, I, um, my organizing experience is mainly in Chinatown and the Low East Side. Uh, and uh, she, uh, how we also introduce uh, also part of the citywide alliance against placement. But tonight, I guess I only represent myself um, here. Uh, so when I, you know, talk to folks about you know the topic tonight, right, socialist solution and housing, 
Uh, one, one of the question is that, um, is New York City already a, a socialist city? Well, it might, it might be true because we have a lot of uh, co-ops, right? We have, uh, and we have uh, NYCHA, right? The biggest uh, public housing projects in the, in the country. Then, I mean, you know, you, you guys laugh, right? So why, why is not a socialist uh, uh, city, right? Because, you know, from, from the direct experience, we see that, uh, you know, we have, have a lot of tenant evictions in the city. We have, uh, you know, small business shut down. We have uh, workers losing their jobs. And even like the small landowners, you know, they can't really maintain because of the, you know, high real estate tax. Uh, and uh, we, we also see, you know, a lot of housing groups and uh, they become managers and they become landlords themselves and they even start to take out their own tenants. Uh, in China and Low East Side, you know, we have examples like that. Um, or, you know, these, these housing groups, they become, you know, after they become landlords, they even lease their storefronts to, to Whole Foods, right, for example. So, why, you know? You might, you might wonder. Because, uh, you know, we, we have a city that really represents the, the risk developers' interests, right? Not really representing the community's interests. Because they concentrate the powers in the, in the few, in the, in the few on one hand, and then throw some crumbs, you know, to communities and uh, let them fight each other on the other hand. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because, you know, right now, if you look at uh, Mayor de Blasio as an example, he's trying to pass, uh, you know, the pro developer rezoning plans, you know, across the city. And uh, on the other hand, he tried to say, act like progressive. He's, he's saying that, okay, I'll pass some laws to protect the tenants. Right? For example, when a tenant's got sued in, the, in court, I, I'll, I'll give you uh, free lawyers. Um, but then what these lawyers uh, often do is that, oh, you know, the, the, the law is very weak. Uh, you know, the, the landlord is so powerful, you know, maybe nothing, nothing much we can do. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a sad reality in the, in, in, in the city. And uh, you know, even even if you you know find the core you know drag out for years, then uh, you know you probably you know it will be a much a waste of time for the tenants. Uh, from our experience, you know you have tenants, you know you have you have to ask for leave, you know, for, for, to to stay in the morning to, to go to court, and you have to go go to court you know time and time again. And uh, you know why not just just you know uh, uh, kill the root cause that 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 you know really even cause you all these trouble from the beginning, right? But of course the Brazilians has no interest in doing that. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, you have a lot of community resistance uh, coming up. But, uh, you know, at the end, you know, they, they either uh, uh, give up, you know, by moving away, you know, like what the tenants are, you know, fighting, you know, the city say, oh, you know, you can, you can have, a, have your day in court, but then gradually, you know, they, they fizzle out and they move away. Or, you know, these, these community groups, they become sellouts to the community uh, by, you know, accepting some crumbs, but they're not really challenging the, 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 the mayor's uh, policy. So in the end of the day, the, the, uh, the mayor is helping the developers to, to divide the community, uh, to divide them so small so that the, the developers, they end up becoming the majority who are the most united. Um, so you know, when we talk about socialist solution, we're actually talking about a strategy that you know, we present to, to, to unite the people and uh, to really build power you know, again, against a common enemy. So you know, first of all, who is the people? Well, in terms of the, the displacement, you know, we're actually talking about a wide spectrum. Um, you know, we, we're talking about people who live in a community. We're talking about people who work in a community, you know, who contribute, you know, their labor to the community. We're talking about people who do business, you know, in the community, you know, who help really help the, the community thrive. You know, or have any connection, you know, to the community. You know, if you, you know, see yourself as, as you know, as that, then you're part of the community. So, you know, we, we see that all these people, you know, we all have a common interest in protecting and preserving, you know, a safer community, right? And then, you know, then who's the, who's the enemy then? Well, the enemy, you know, you can say, okay, a certain developer in your community and, and another developer in another community. Uh, but, you know, that, that way, the struggle becomes fragmented, right? So then you're talking about different enemies. Um, but what we're talking about is not just one developer or even a group of developers, but developers as a class. But uh, you know they don't act out of a vacuum, right? They act politically, and they act through their representative in city hall. So you know we're talking about now. You know we have a city government. You know that's for developers and Mayor De Palacio. You know as uh, as the who as the, the person who has a final say in all these policies. You know uh, uh, coming around, and he's been called the fire in chief. So you know that you know at, at the current stage, you know he's the one that we we should unite up against. 
Um, I can you know, give you an example of how we organize in the, in the lower east side. Um, I can use the Bowery tenants as an example, the tenants of 83, 85 Bowery. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they originally, of course, they, they face an uh, uh, eviction case you know, from their landlord. And, um, and of course, you know, they have to go to the legal stuff and all of that. Right? But uh, you know, they can easily frame it as a you know, problem of one landlord and one, one greedy landlord. And in, you know, in fact, you know, of course, that's a fact. But uh, we also, they also see that the mechanism behind this, you know, who, you know, allow levels like this, you know, to, to come in, you know, buy properties and start kicking out low-income families, right? And it's so, so that, that, that's a city. And the most direct experience is uh, earlier this year, the, the, one of the buildings, 85 Bowery, got evicted in two hours by the city agency. So the landlord figure out that okay, if we, if they can't if we can't kick out the, the tenants uh, through court, then might as well you know through the Department of Building, which is faster. Um, and uh, the tenant they they, they right, right away see that oh you know how come the city is helping the landlord but not us you know when when our our, our, our buildings you know uh, the the condition deteriorate the, the the city agency never say a word but now they use this excuse to kick us out. Um, and, uh, and, and when they do, you know, do their action, they see that, of course, it's not happen, only happening in their one building, but buildings across the city. People coming in, share their story about how DOB you know, helped help keep out their tenants for years. Uh, so, you know, that, and, and that agency, of course, they, 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 they work under the, under the administration that really helped the, help the level, helped the developers. So you know, ultimately, they, they, they really uh, from from uh, from a, a campaign against the landlord become a campaign again against the mayor, against the mayor's policy that really destroy communities across the city, and that's the only way that that, that really galvanize uh, support. You know, not only in Chinatown on the east side, but you know across all five boroughs. So you know, we see that that's a way to reunite the city. And they're not only fighting against eviction to stay in the community, but they're also fighting a, a, a concrete solution, you know, to, to really put a protection on the, in the community. And that's, uh, you know, many, maybe some of you know, we, you know, we're fighting uh, for uh, a community-led rezoning, the Chinatown Working Group Plan. Uh, and like Alicia said earlier, you know, they, like in, in Bloomberg administration, they try to put protection in, in, the, in the wide middle class area, but then in, in, in an exclusion of the communities of color. So in the, in the Lower East Side Chinatown, we have that, that example, you know, they protect the East Village, uh, but when we ask for the, our own protection, the city say, okay, then you guys should wait. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we come up with, uh, when we come up with a solution, the Chinatown Working Group Plan basically asked for the same protection uh, as the this village. The mayor said that we, we are too ambitious. You know, how come we're too ambitious when we basically ask for the same protection as in this village? You know, because that, that, that plan basically, you know, um, as a way to, to kind of uh, tackle the developer's interest because, you know, developers come in, they want to build high rise. You know, we just want to say, okay, we'll put a high limits, you know, so as a way to, you know, to, to really curtail, you know, their, 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 their own motive to, to build high rise there. And we also demand that, you know, in the, in the public land, you know, we have a uh, nicer property, you know, in, in the Lower East Side. That, you know, if, if you want to develop a land there, you, you develop a, a, a building there, it should be 100% uh, affordable uh, for the low-income families in the neighborhood, not, not, the, not the, you know, the, the forming AMI. So, and of course, it doesn't want to see that happen, right? So, but this plan, you know, really unites uh, uh, different parts of the communities uh, from coming together, you know, Chinese, Blacks, Latinos, and even Whites. Because they all, you know, live in the same same neighborhood. They all have the same interests, you know, of community protection. And uh, in this process, the bar tenants really uh, taking the lead to fight to have that the, the plan passed. So as you know, as a result, they you know they they, they, they become you know they, they start out as a victim, you know, uh, of eviction, and they become like the leaders of the community. And so you know, when we talk about the socialist solution, you know, we're really talking about the way you know we should unite the community. To build power, you know, to really challenge, challenge the city. You know, we say no to the pro developer rezoning, and uh, you know, we encourage the community to come up, you know, the alternative. And uh, in our community, is the community land rezoning plan, the Chinatown Working Group plan, and you know, we also encourage other communities to you know to come up with uh, you know a solution uh, uh, beyond you know, fighting against uh, the mayor's uh, rezoning. And of course, we you know we urge organizations to join our citywide alliance against uh, displacement. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Tom Honan. I'm with the Socialist Party and I am also a tenant attorney. Um, actually, my, my job by day was directly from the de Blasio rezoning plan in Inwood to give it. And the cover, as you mentioned, the cover, oh, we're going to provide free attorneys. 
And yes, I agree. Um, but what I want to talk about is uh, when, when I'm in court uh, and talking to uh, landlords and landlord attorneys, um, I'll often ask them, why are you trying to evict this person? What's your motivation for getting this person out? And as you can probably guess, the, the answer is always, oh, we're a business and we need to make as much profit as possible. Um, and that justification for evicting tenants is accepted by our, our system in court, accepted by the judges, and uh, accepted by both of the capitalist parties. Um, so I've been recently thinking about uh, tenant unions and how to uh, build power among tenants to actually confront uh, landlords and their profit motivation. Um, currently, in our system, um, it make, the housing court makes it, and our laws make it almost impossible to actually organize tenant unions or tenant associations. Uh, and I'm going to discuss a couple of reasons why that is. Um, but I really, I, I really want to say that currently tenant associations only form and organize in order to, when the landlord is doing something that they perceive as wrong, not making repairs, overcharging them, uh, there's a gas outage in the building, but really tenants should be able to organize and uh, use their rent or withholding their rent to enter into negotiations with the landlord and bargaining, make demands on the landlord for what services they need, and bargain with the landlord for reducing rents, uh, capping the increases that landlords can take. And so I think the rent stabilization laws and rent control laws should really be maximums for increasing the rent, and tenants should be able to organize to effectively bargain with their landlord. Uh, that's not really possible with or it's very difficult with the current laws. Uh, if tenants withhold their rent, um, and if you look around the city over the past maybe 10 years, there has not really been large scale rent strikes. Uh, there were previously, and there's some examples, but there really have not been large scale rent strikes. And often we, when we're working with tenant associations, we, uh, we often counsel not to enter into a rent strike. And the reason is that the results are very limited because the landlord will start an eviction case against you for not paying rent against all the tenants. And what you get at the end of that case is maybe money back for any, some wrongdoing by the landlord. But what can't happen is the case can't be stopped for you to enter into this bargaining. So it really, takes away the tenant's ability to use withholding rent as a, a, a tactic to, to gain power. Um, the other major consideration is, you know, uh, tenant blacklisting, which I'm sure people have heard about. If you're taken to court for any case, you're put onto a blacklist, and this then is used by landlords across the country to, uh, to kind of see if a tenant has been taken to court and use that not to rent to them. Um, say, oh, you're a bad tenant, you were taken to court, I don't want to deal with it, so I won't rent to you. Um, and if you're just taken to court by your landlord in New York City, you end up on that list. It's the uh, credit reporting agency, so uh, we'll go to the courthouse and type up a list. Um, so really those two things prevent tenants from uh, organizing into actual tenant unions to be able to say to their landlord, we want to bargain with you, we want to make these demands over what our rent should be, we want the rents lower, we want to see your, um, we want to see your uh, spreadsheets and how, what the profit is in this building and we want to reduce that. We want to essentially demand the, way, the same way a labor union. Um, So one thing that can be done to 
a lot of times to organize in that way um, is to strengthen the current real property law that provides a right to organize in New York for tenants. Um, that law is currently very non-existent. It basically says tenants have a right to meet in their building um, and can't be harassed for meeting in their building. But that doesn't actually provide any protection or any ability to, act, to, to really truly organize. Um, so strengthening that into a law that allows tenants to organize and make demands on their landlord and to withhold their rent without being taken to court by the landlord once you're engaged in this process until you can come to a bargain would be an actual law that could allow organizers to start creating tenant organizations to, to start building that, uh, the, that power among tenants. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, rent control and rent stabilization. Um, we need new rent control laws that um, are passed across across the state that limit what the or that stop the landlord from raising the rent, um, creating some sort of democratic process for when the landlord does want to uh, increase the rent and applying to do that and having to justify it uh, to. Uh, either a, a board or um, some group. Um, instead of, as been talked about at length, instead of pushing forward policies like uh, rent control, uh, statewide rent control, uh, the two capitalist parties have really, their solution is really rezoning. Um, and that's basically been it. Um, and I, I primarily work in Inwood. The rezoning plan in Inwood just passed. I've seen speculative landlords purchase uh, entire blocks um, in Inwood just because they know that um, the rezoning may pass. Uh, they've paid, we've been able to see what they've paid for those buildings and they're uh, way above market uh, knowing they and they built into their plans, we will buy these buildings and then bring eviction cases right away. Um, one type of case we've seen uh, uh, with that properties that the landlord did was uh, non-primary residence cases, um, just buying the building and essentially saying that the tenants don't actually live in their apartments and bringing uh, cases basically against entire buildings for that justification. Um, but that's a that's an aside, I guess. Um, so rent control was possible politically at one point. That's why we had rent control uh, since 1947 when initially rent control passed. It's slowly been worked back. So in the 70s, we then switched to rent stabilization, which effectively tried to get rid of all rent control apartments and created this new system. In 1997, we passed a uh, reforms to the rent stabilization law, which included a lot of these things that people are fighting against now, like vacancy increases um, and deregulation after a certain, the rent reaches a certain level. Um, so we've really progressively worked away from uh, what was once politically possible, and I think uh, we need to get be fighting to get back and organizing to get to that place where we can be demanding citywide rent control again. Saying, and what rent control did is it said every building built before a certain year is capped at a rent level. Um, so that, to me, right now seems uh, politically impossible, but it's something that we should be demanding and working towards. The other uh, thing I will say about rent control is, and why we have to be organizing outside of New York City and into the more rural areas, is that the state passes rent control, they pass the reforms. Um, so what is what often happens is it's a really easy scheme for the real estate industry to give a bunch of money 
to the legislature in upstate New York whose constituents don't benefit from rent control um, and having them vote against uh, the rent control law. So it's really this scheme that's been set up where the, um, the, the real estate uh, lobbyists can pay off uh, up rural upstate New York um, politicians to vote against rent stabilization and rent control. And um, this has been both Democrats and Republicans. So, first thing I want to point out is that this is not a problem unique to New York City. Your rents are going through the roof, but you don't even rank among the top 25 cities last year in terms of how fast rents are going up. Buffalo was number three. Whoa. You weren't even in the top 25. Some of the coast cities, uh, you know, out west are even uh, rising higher. And what that means is that homelessness and people paying more than the 30% of income federal affordability standard, and actually about a quarter of the people in the New York State pay over 50% of their income on rent. And, you know, basically these revenue bullies, as they're called, and, uh, you know, as people have pointed out, they finance the Democrats who run the state. And the Republicans are kind of the junior partners, you know, out of Long Island, Westchester, upstate. And what they get, as was just pointed out, is they get some money to make sure they vote right on New York City rent regulations. I mean, we have a Republican in Wayne County who's been unopposed for 26 years. He gets New York State real estate money to do his little unopposed campaign so he votes the right way when the state deals with rent regulation in New York City. I mean, that's crazy. And what we've seen in the last basically 40 years is the rich get very much richer and a lot of people are losing the ability to pay their rent to stay in their homes. So in 1980, the top 1% New York State got 12% of all income. Last year, in statewide, they got 31%, almost triple. And in New York City, the 1% went from 12% in 1980 to 41% today. So imagine I'm the rich guy and I got a dollar of pennies in my hand and I take almost half of them and give them to me. And then I throw it out to the rest of you. And a couple of you will get two or three pennies and most will maybe get one, and then a lot of people will get nothing. That's basically the way income is distributed in this city and almost as badly in the state. We're the most unequal state in the nation. And who has increased, who has increased their uh, wealth the most? It's the landlords. And the bankers are live with them. Because as values go up, they borrow money collateralizing their real estate, land, and property. And so when you pay your rent, a lot of that ends up going to the banker's interest. And just think of Donald Trump. As far as we know, he's in the red. You know, if he had a balance sheet. He just got a lot of cash flowing because he got the Russians buying his condos and then he can go and borrow money against that. Not in this country anymore because he don't pay it back, but, you know, Deutsche Bank and Russian oligarchs. But that's the game. I mean, he's so crooked he had to go foreign. But most of the landlords here can do it domestically. Uh, Kushner's another one who had to go foreign. But, and then you turn around, those two guys don't pay any taxes. Because they can write off losses that are paper losses and they can depreciate their values so much it subtracts from what they owe. And the real estate industry is basically living off the rest of us and getting fat by it. This isn't even capitalism exploiting labor. This is old-fashioned feudalism where the land